Welcome to the Earthworks Podcast, where our team will share the jargon of carbon from many of our turf friends from the past 30 years. Hi, everybody. Kevin Hicks here with Earthworks, another podcast uh, coming to you. Um, I'm fortunate to have Mr. Randy Booker back for a second trip. Uh, he's got some new information that I insisted he share with the turf world. Um, you took an intensive course, Randy. Thanks for coming on again, by the way. We had a good conversation before we uh, started recording here, and I, I'm excited. I think it's going to be a good good conversation. So, um, Glad to be here again. Yeah, you took a course uh, by a woman by the name of Nicole Masters. Tell me about who she is, what she represents, and why the heck a grass farmer was was in that group. Okay. Um, well, the course is still ongoing, Kev. It, it, uh, it's a complete, it's a four month long project that uh, Nicole has put together and give you a little background on Nicole herself. Um, she's a Kiwi from New Zealand. Um, right. She's a uh, an agroecologist, a systems thinker, adult educator. Um, she is the the owner founder of Integrity Soils out of New Zealand, and I actually found her. Um, so I mentioned the last time when I went to Australia and took the the NutriTech Solutions, the Graham Sate program for five days where it really kicked me and, and got me into the biological um, aspect. Um, Nicole was doing a, uh, a week-long workshop with Graham Sate in New Zealand. And it nope. was like, oh, my God, I wish I could be there. Would she have been a protege of his or were they just um, teaching in conjunction with each other? Well, or? you know what? She, yeah, to, to a little bit of a degree. Um, you know what, when you, when you talk to her, one of her, she's got many mentors, um, Arden Anderson, I guess was, is her primary mentor, right. but you know what, a lot of what we talk about and a lot of what we're doing and we're dealing with, um, comes from our good buddy. And, and I wish I would have met him. You certainly, you know, Jerry Brunetti, right. um, he is in her background as well. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of good people that she has um, followed, learned from, learned with, um, and gotten to the point where right now she is one of the, well, um, her and John Kempf, I would say right now, are about the two people that are on the busy schedule of um, Zoom meetings, webinars, um, unfortunately not traveling the world because of the, still the COVID aspect, but sure. she is one of the leading agroecologist uh, teachers. Um, she was doing an awful lot of consulting for ranchers and for farms, uh, big and small. But she's gotten back uh, into her roots, which is really teaching. And, and this program that I'm on right now, it's called CREATE. And it is, if I can remember the acronym here, it is Consciously Recreating Ecological Agricultural Systems Through um, Regenerative Experiences. Okay. So what it is, um, it's coach the coaches kind of deal. Um, Interesting little process we went through. There, there was 75 people that applied for this program. Uh, we had to fill out applications. We had to do an online interview with Nicole herself, um, of which I, I kind of had admired because she did a webinar in Ontario sector here a year ago mm -hmm. and was just blown away <laughs> by the number of golf course people that were participating in this webinar. And I had been in touch with her prior too. So she knew that I was playing around with regenerative golf. Let's, let's use that phrase. I love it. So um, when this program came out uh, as part of a face, Facebook group that Integrity Soils has, and uh, I thought, man, I'm in. You know what? To First off, to meet her was one of the issues. And then the second was to learn from this lady would just be unbelievable. 
So needless to say, I went through the whole process of the interviews. Um, I didn't have to do an awful lot of the application process because she was already aware of, of what I was doing. Sure. She already knew the impact that I was having. And, you know, I sent her a couple, uh, a little bit of the portfolio I had, which was the GCSAA uh, webinar I did back in February and a few of the articles I've written and some of those things. I was in. I was in right away. So that's it. She's building disciples. She's, she's essentially trying to build disciples to get the word out. That's exactly what she's trying to do. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and she's, she's in Montana right now, as, right. as you know, you mentioned the last time, uh, not that far from you. And like she left the New Zealand aspect because uh, it, it, the bureaucratic governmental BS that went on in trying to have the government recognize um, regenerative processes. Um, she just couldn't deal with that. So she left uh, New Zealand, came to the States, and, and she's just been humming away like crazy ever since. Um, uh, her, her, uh, wrote a book, and her book came out a year ago for the love of soil. You know, I recommend people to, to either read it or go on and get the audio version of it. It's, it's just a real cool storytelling type book um yeah and i'm the only golf guy yeah. you know 70 75 people were interviewed they took 20 of us um we met in georgia in the second week of november to to get together and meet each other and start the process and okay it was um powerful powerful yeah. to say the least so so it was uh it was a week long and then you said it's continuing uh, via via Zoom or via uh, webinar. Yeah. yeah. So, um, how, what was the structure? I mean, a, a lot of what you know, a lot of the people you mentioned are are the big players: Jerry Brunetti, Arden Anderson, in several classes. Um, they're players in the eco agriculture community. Um, you know, really built that Acres USA eco ag. Uh, community from the ground up and and Graham Sate was another one that was was incredibly influential in Jerry's life um, and yeah and so so what's the structure I mean you've got people from varied backgrounds um, I I know that from being at several acres conferences you know you're you're pretty much in in class learning something from eight o'clock until nine o'clock um that they they have a they have an energy about them those those conferences and those meetings that that uh, uh that that's pretty special well when you when you have like minds in the same room and you know we're not talking 300 people we're talking uh there was a total of 23 people in the room mm -hmm. so there's 20 students 20 participants uh nicole masters herself um uh, Megan Lannon, who who is uh, works with Nicole, and Dee Dee Pearhouse. Um, so twenty three of us in this room, and all very passionate people in the regenerative mindset. In you know what, there's got to be a better way to do things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was the only turf head. It it felt very awkward in the first uh, little bit, uh, almost like you know, what the hell am I doing here? You know right. what? I'm not producing food. I'm, I'm, I'm not really, um, for the good of the system, right? It, sure. It's we're still golf. We're still a very extractive business. And I kind of thought, why am I here, uh, amongst, um, grass fed beef producers and, um, uh, there's, there's a couple of university extensionists in there and there's farm, small farm market, uh, veggie growers. And, you know, I thought, wow. Um, but once the system started to roll and the key word I just used was system. Yeah. Yeah. Because we are part of a system. Absolutely. And as you know, we talked the last time we were together that we don't control the system. We are a part of it. And until we recognize that fact, we're not really going anywhere. Direct um, port the system, but we're not in control of it. Yeah. You know what? We have no control. 
Right. You know, we, we think we do. You know, as humans, we, we seem to think that we are at the top of that chain and, you know, what, what we do will, um, uh, will give us the outcome we want. But I think we're all evident right now that, you know, Mother Nature rules, whether it be with the weather, the climate, with COVID, with whatever the case you want to be. Uh, and that's, the, uh, that's the, the kind of the opening mind that we have to start to think about. Yeah. So that, that was the general aspect. Yeah, we were together eight o'clock, uh, 7.30 in the morning, we would have breakfast together and then we'd go over into, we were at White Oaks Pastures. If anybody ever, just, just go on the internet and, and search up White Oaks Pasture. Um, a gentleman by the name of Will Harris, he's got a 3,200 acre farm in Bluffton, Georgia, that is 100% closed loop regenerative. Hmm. There is nothing absolutely nothing that leaves the property including energy um uh no oh, that, okay. we'll pull the energy aspect sure. out okay. okay but as far as waste material goes right. and as far as no fertility nothing brought in uh has his own processing plant for his beef for uh chickens poultry the whole deal he has it all on site uh, built his own processing plant, uh, processes all the meats, takes all the visceral, takes everything over to a compost area, uh, basically lets it compost for 12 to 18 months and then goes and spreads it out on his fields. And that's his system. And it, it's, it's phenomenal, um, you know, the soil he's built and the system that he has going there. And, and yeah. it, Again, it's one of those, you know what, if we feed the system and we work along with it, things become very, very easy and simple. Right. So, so it, was a, it, it was a busy week, uh, not, uh, yeah. needless to say. You know what, we'd, <laughs> we'd go until 1230, have a bite to eat. We'd go right back into it. We'd be in classroom until 530 at night. Then we'd kind of just take a half an hour or so to to veg and have dinner and you know what here's people from 24 to 71 all in this group uh like years of age and 7 30 8 o'clock at night first couple nights we'd stand around the fire outside and then it's like oh crap i'm tired you know what i'm <laughs> mentally <laughs> mentally wiped so yeah. everybody go back and go to bed you know get up and repeat yeah well i'll bet at the end of the day after initial introductions and so forth, it was probably harder, even though, you know, we discussed before we got on that, that, that turf managers have a, an elitism sort of a, a viewpoint of how they manage their, their acreage versus maybe the average farmer. And, and that, that may be a generality, but I'll bet the, the adapt adaptability of the, uh, the university extension agents was probably tougher than it would be for you. Right. And, and, and the, ex the accepted nature of the group, I mean, those guys into the fold, because it's, it's a, it's a totally different mindset in that, in that part of the, the agriculture world, isn't it? Uh, completely, yeah. completely. Um, there's actually, there was a couple others in there that were, um, is it NRCS, correct? Yeah, there was a couple of NRCS agents as well that really got out of that system again because it was, I'm stuck in the office. I really don't want to work with this system, and I really don't want to follow the conventional sort of um, researched aspect. And um, one of the students, Brian Doherty from Iowa, is actually he's he's slowly convincing the university there to start to think about uh, a more regenerative research aspect. And, mm -hmm. and they actually jumped on wagon with them and said, go take this because we really want to, uh, we have to do this. Yeah. And you know what? The, he, he came in brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, but again, the ag sense, it opened my eyes up. I got kicked in the ass a couple of times, as you say, right. because of that little bit of elitism that we kind of think about, um, you know, thinking about the systems and how things are working and our mindset. And I kept uh, kind of implying the first couple of days, I, you know what, it, I'm, I'm really trying to make this work with turf. I'm really trying to switch this around and bring it into the concept of turf. And 
And finally, Nicole Masters basically said to me, Randy, shut up. <laughs> you know what? Um, if she'd have been any closer to me, I'm sure she would either slap me in the face or kick me in the ass because it was, you're no different than anybody else. Right. You know what? Growing grass is no different than growing a crop. You know, it might be in your mind, but in the realm of nature and in the system, absolutely no difference. Right. You know what? It it's all comes from soil. And we have to think about the concept of soil. And that's where I think we lose it from the turf standpoint, because we think of soil solely as a, a medium to house the plant. That's right. That's and right. that's it. Yeah. Right. Especially on, really... especially on prepared surfaces like greens. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. But when you start to think about soil being the underlying issue of, of all plant life on, on, on the plant planet, it starts to make sense. Mm -hmm. And it starts to make things so much easier to comprehend and so much easier to understand how we can um, work with the system and how we can feed the system. Otherwise, you know what, hands off and let the system do its thing. Right. The, I think the strides that have been made from a, a biological aspect, and I'm talking microbiologists and, and soil biologists in the last 10, 15 years, um, like some of these guys were way ahead of their time. I, I, we see some research articles now within this program, you know, from the, the 1800s and late 1800s when they're talking about soil organisms and how they react and how they work. And where'd that stuff go? Right. 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 Well, like you said, before we, before we jumped on, you know, we, we want to have control. We want to have control of the system and that's how modern agriculture and certainly modern turf grass management adopted the the principles and yeah. and we can't have control <laughs> we can have no. influence but we can't have control no we we can participate and we can participate to a pretty good deal um but all we're there to do is assist where needed right you know what uh i think you know something just came to my mind it's kind of funny when you think about you know the superman or sorry the spider-man aspect comes out you know with with uh talking about the control and responsibility and mm. you know what i in all my years that i've come to um working with turf and leaving the golf course at night the last handful have been the gentlest and the least pressure filled that I have ever experienced in my life. Then it's such a key too, because you know, the system's going to continue running, whether you're there with your thumb on it or not. Right. Yeah. 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 You know yeah. what? And, and it's once you accept, um, we are our own worst enemies, yeah, right. humans in general. But uh, I think when we look at golf course superintendents, we, we are our own worst enemies. Right. And you know, I don't mean to to bash PhDs or academia, you know, and that's one thing I wanted to kind of uh, to get in here today that last time we talked, I kind of did do a little bash of that aspect. But you know what, it, it's not it's not for the lack, as you said earlier, about trying, you know, we're all trying to do the best that we can. And unfortunately, the synthetic chemical mindset that we have right now is one that has been taught for more than just our generation. Right. Right. And it's, it's all we've known. Yeah. But it's not, it's, it, I don't, it's not the right system. Well, and it takes a concerted effort by the individual, regardless of what industry you're in to, to really, I've heard the term a lot lately, yourself out of this to to really your mindset and and look at things a little bit differently like you're saying look at it holistically um but you have to you know i think about that that uh spinny thing in the playground you know where where the, the last guy to fall off was was the the one but you know the probably in this case it's the first guy to jump off is going to be the guy that's going to going to get uh, furthest down the road quickest right yep 
So, yeah. so we talked, we talked quite a bit last time about what you do on your property to apply what you've learned through the years, but specifically to, to, you know, your, your week in Georgia, the continuing ed stuff that you've done, what from that foundation, what now have you had? I mean, you're, you're, you're in Ontario, you're in wintertime, you've got time to kind of collect your thoughts and think about things. What, what few bullet points for the, the 2022 season are you really looking forward to applying and changing maybe, maybe or adjusting a little the take um yeah more adjustments than than really changing and and um, and if I, I let me add one more thing to it uh, what of that week was affirming to 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 what you've been doing well, we had, uh, I mean, we had to send soil samples away as part of this as okay. well. And, and they went uh, probably not that far from, uh, from where you are in, in Earth Fort Labs. Yeah. And, I want to get into that, that aspect of it too. So we'll get you know, to that. And also, also the micro root lab. Okay. So that, that just kind of leads in what I will be doing more than anything else this year is doing my own monitoring. And of um well i think the biggest thing uh, of which we never do because uh, we think it'll ruin our surface but you know what we still we have to dig holes we have to look at visually look mm -hmm. at soils mm -hmm. we have to visually um look at what our plant is doing uh not only up on the surface which we're very good at but below the ground okay. You know, we, we take the odd profile out, we take some soil samples, we pull a probe out, we look at it for moisture more than anything else, and we either stick it back in the ground or take the turf plug off, stick it in, throw everything else away. But the, the real thing that I think comes in with this systems approach is you start to plan something. And, and first off, the mindset change is probably the absolute biggest thing that you have to get beyond. And once you start to do one or two small little practices um, that align with more of nature's laws, um, just in the form, we talk about drainage and we talk about water infiltration. Well, you're not going to have uh, great infiltration unless you can build up your, uh, your fungal count in the ground. Right. You know, bacteria uh, emit those little glues to stick the, the, the micro aggregates together. Fungi come along and take all of those little micros, stick them together and give you aggregate structure. Mm -hmm. Aggregate structure is going to give you the ability to hold on to some nutrient. It's going to give you the ability to free drain when you need to free drain, but right. hold moisture as well. You know what? We don't think about that. We think about sand. We just want sand in there because we want it to drain and we want it to be playable after a big rain. Well, when you start to look at what happens with no-till fields and you start to look at from the ag sense where guys have gone in and they have not disturbed the ground, they will plant a green cover crop. They will mm -hmm. plant and it will become a green manure. They'll just roll or crimp it down. And then they will just go direct drill right into that. And they don't disturb any of the soil. And then you look at them when they get a, a substantial rainfall and you put it beside a conventionally grown egg system. And you have a massive amount of water that's sitting in the conventional field above ground and right. you have no water sitting on top of the surface right. in the no-till yep. well that goes against absolutely everything that we think about that we need to disturb we need to aerify we need to pull up we need to do all that it doesn't work in nature right, right. and it, it, yeah it's it's a change going oh god yeah but we're growing a uh, uh, we're not growing a natural system well we are because we're still growing in soil mm -hmm. and we're still determinant on nutrients be that minerals in the ground or if we still have to add some um, we're dealing with a natural system we're manipulating the top surface but it is growing in nature and we still have to look at those laws so when i what what i'll be doing this year is is more so monitoring what i've been doing when i see some changes 
I'll readapt the plan. Okay. And then I can monitor, you know what? Uh, we're dealing with a dynamic system and it changes every second of the day. Um, uh, it's funny because I had a couple superintendents that, that follow me on Twitter and our local guys. And they said, you know what? We want to come out and see your turf. It's great to blast out on Twitter. It's great, yeah. to, it's great to do these things, you know what, and show pictures. But these but guys. But it's got to be the, garbage. Got to see it. It's got to be just garbage, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> like, Booker, what, what's Booker doing? You know what? Right. His surface can't be all that great. Sure. Well, they came out and, and it was like, oh, man. Uh, firm surfaces? No, I don't top dress. So I'm not falling into that, you know firm more sand makes it firmer because you know what as we, and i just saw a webinar dan Danelli did for us again talking about bio, biological aspects and and showed again his video that i i just love in yeah. the ball bounce aspect yeah. you know what if if you don't take that and say all right um he solitines and throws compost down and that's about it yeah and Look at the surface. It's hard. It's firm. No stress, no wilt, and mm -hmm. no disease. Right. Like, man, what? Why not do that? Moisture held where it needs to be and draining perfectly where it where it needs to be evacuated. Jerry, you know, and, and one of the things managing turf in the West for as long as I have, um, and it's mentioned in Jerry Brunetti's book that he talks about soil organic matter, and I'm not talking thatch, but soil organic matter, you know, the, the, the good stuff. Carbon, humans. Yeah. Um, for every 1% increase, I think we've talked about this, for every 1% increase, you can hold 25,000 additional gallons of water per acre. Yeah. Well, in the West, when, you know, a lot of my clients are, are thankful to have six, seven inches of rain a year, um, that could mean something to them, you know, yeah. but, but you've got to have a, like you said, you've got to have a mind shift on, on how you're approaching things. And one of the keys that, that Nicole stresses, um, is, you know, what, when you talk about rain events and it's funny because now, whenever we see something on Twitter that, oh, we got an inch and a half of rain. Oh, did you really? You know what? You may have gotten an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch, and the rest of it just ran away because it had no place to go. Right. You know what? It couldn't infiltrate in the ground because we just don't have that system working. Right. Right. And and honestly, sand will do, will drain it away. But you know what? We have to stop thinking that we can grow this in sand. Um, obviously, there are the the physical components of of growing in sand that we all appreciate sure the chemical aspect when you think about it and we're talking chemistry so we're talking about the um the the mineralization of the sand particles you know what there's enough nutrient in those sand particles to last us our lifetime and we forever say but they're not available well no they aren't available under our current system right but as soon as you introduce the biological aspect and you introduce fungi into that, you know, bacteria will start to play and they'll release some phosphates for you as well. And you start to get into the, um, the fungi getting down and, and uh, specifically when you start to get into a mycorrhizal aspect, mm -hmm. man, you know what? You've just opened up a whole, a whole load of, of uh, mineralization that can go on and, uh, the interaction between the plant and the soil is something that they are still trying to figure out, but um, that's some of the stuff that we're diving into in right. just how plants and biology communicate, you know, yeah. it, it's, and it's something again, uh, mentioned the last time we as humans, we, we can't think that small and we don't think that way. Mm -hmm. You know, every cell that's every cell of the plant, um, every cell in our aspects, you know, what? And Jerry does this in, in his uh, super organisms. When he talks, there's a hundred thousand receptors on every cell. Right. And the number of reactions that are taking place every second. We cannot fathom that. Yeah. And how, and how can we not expect the same thing to be happening in our soils? Right. 
It is. Yeah, right? absolutely. It, it is. Right. Sometimes, yeah, we need to get out of the way. We yep. need to watch it. We need to participate. But, um, you know, so I guess to go back to your original question a while ago was, what am I <laughs> going to be doing this year? Well, you know what? I'm throwing a lot more compost out. I'm doing an awful lot of, um, I actually, I put out um, over 18,000 pounds of pelletized compost on the golf course in, last November. So it's not, uh, so it's not your compost. It's something you're, you're pulling from offsite. It is something I'm pulling from offsite. So, Although, all, right. all right. So talk about that for a minute. What's important in a compost? Because compost is, has been hijacked and bastardized for a better way of saying it about as badly as the word organic. Um, you know, organics are not necessarily um, uh, synonymous with the most healthy. They may be pesticide free, but they may not be the best nutrient uh, value and so on and so forth. So what's a good compost in your eyes or what did you learn? Well, what I've learned is, is that there are many ways to make a compost, right? Um, not only in your static piles, but in your thermophilic stages and, and, and the piles that, you know, like Elaine Ingham gets into the 30 day composting process. Um, to get her biocomplete compost. And then you've got the Johnson Sioux bioreactors type compost. Um, you have your traditional um, uh, compost that's done on, on large areas, turned and over. And, yep. but, but the key the key element is producing a compost that has the correct ratio of fungi to bacteria components. Like mm -hmm. you can produce a very fungal compost you can produce a very bacterial compost so starting with that what are you trying to do with the product and now is that is that through manipulating the inputs and the yeah. ingredients or the yeah. process itself no it's it, the process the process is is it's really the just a, it's the it's the same and one yeah. one will go 30 or 60 days one will go for 12 months to 18 months right it's not really the process, it's the ingredients. Right. Um, you know, you want more of a fungal based compost, you're going to have more brown materials, you're going to have more leaves, you're going to have more um, twigs, uh, sticks, you know, more of those browns, the, the, the lignin rich products. Certainly, you need some, um, some, some, uh, readily digestible grass clippings um, or leafy structures uh, to break down quick and get the bacterial sure. component and yada, 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 right? We, we can go through all that standpoint, but uh, I think the key that you want to be looking at is not the mineral analysis of a compost. Right. Who cares? Right. You know, I we think can get the other sources. We can get that in other ways, it, yeah. you know what, or, or once you get the system working for you, the system has the, the nutrient there. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of how and, and what is going to go get that mineral for the plant. Yeah. So the, the again, the compost aspect is, okay, you certainly want to look from the, uh, the organic matter component of it, what it's made of, uh, not necessarily the um, the mineral content of it, more the fungal bacterial ratio is where I go now. And how do we know that? How do you how how do we test that? If you're purchasing it from somebody, you ask for the testing results. How many if, how many of the sources you've you've met and spoken with offer that testing versus, like you said, the nutrient testing? Um, not a lot. No, not a lot. Yeah. No, because a lot of it still, our, our mind is, is tied up with traditional soil testing. And mm -hmm. we need to have the NPK component of right. that. Right. And, and you know what? That's not really necessary when we start to do that flip of minds and we start to think about the system in a whole. What you need to start to develop is the organisms that can source all of those nutrients for you. 
Right. So let's let's just look at it. And you mentioned about the water aspect uh, with increasing your your uh, carbon or humus levels. Mm -hmm. Nitrogen is the most overused nutrient that's out there. And we have to think about it. Um, the air we breathe is 79, Eight. 78 yeah. percent nitrogen. Right. So we have, and I mean, I think the number, I don't know whether this is the hectare number or the acre number, but we've got like 35,000 pounds of nitrogen sitting above our turf on an acre basis. Mm. In the how air. Can we, how can we, yeah, how can we get at that? Yeah, biology. Biology. <laughs> Hello. You know what? Nitrogen fixation. And it right. doesn't have to be by legumes. Right. You know what? There are nitrogen fixating bacteria. Rhizobium species. You know what? If you start to get those things working for you, when that plant puts a call out for some N, man, that biology is right there because it knows it's going to get some sugar in right. exchange. Well, and I think that's why uh, folks like yourself that have invested in their soils, they've got biology working now and the proper ratios of fungal to bacterial and things like that. Your inputs tend to be reduced over time because the system is now relying on itself to create a lot of that you know i've seen that time and time again where where turf managers that invest in their soils will report year one year two year three gosh I, i'm using i'm using less inputs now mm -hmm. well that's because the system's doing its job instead of mm -hmm. us getting in the way like you said you know stand back and let it do its thing but there's a thing called nutrient cycling mm -hmm. that's right that's right. right. And, and if, if you start to tap into the nutrient cycle, you know what, those nutrients go any don't, they don't go anywhere. Right. So, you know what, if you can get those evolving soil or air to soil, or originally, if you had to mineral to soil, it will start to work in that system. It'll go into the plant tissue. It'll be used. It would be, you know, whether it is in the grass clippings that go back down or whether it's, it's a compost product that we make on site um, whatever it might be, you know what, all we're doing is we're taking it from one area and reinstituting into another. And it's just a constant cycle of all of these elements as nature intended. Right. Now, would you, you know, consider, um, uh, would you consider the average golf course to be a no-till farm? <laughs> stump st stump the guest well I, I, it's a yes and no answer um they're all right well, let me, they're, let me they're add not to that. No, they're not no till they're they're not no till okay so so with that we're also essentially managing a mono stand a monoculture that is that's the only downfall to a turf system is that we do not have the diversity within the complete system right. if you look at um, most thus, farms in the midwest they're also mon they're also managing monocultures right yeah right so okay so with with um with zero being complete crop failure and a hundred being um the the ideal regenerative acreage where can golf fit? Where, where can, if, if you did everything right, as, as it were, if you did everything you could possibly do, assuming that we're still utilizing that acreage for golf, what, what's achievable? Um, I'm going out on a limb here. But I really think that if we start to work the system, that over time, we can get very, very close to that 100%. Okay. Um, I think we still have a lot of unknowns that are out there right now. Um, we are really just starting to delve into the whole biological process. Right. Um, 
It is still in the infancy stages as to what these microbes do, uh, how many of them there are, the specifics of a lot of them now. Um, the problem is that, you know, these microbes cannot be, be replicated in a lab. Right. And do we so, need to know all of them? No, we don't need to know. Right. You know, I'll tell you what, I'm looking at a computer screen here right now, and I haven't got the slightest clue how my picture is being transformed to you and yours to me and how it's, you know what? But so it does. I, do, I don't know the inner workings of it. You right. know what? But that's for that's for the engineers and that's for those type of people to work with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I, I don't think we... We haven't had the people play with this enough. And you know what? I get drilled a little wee bit about, you know, where's, where's the science? Where's the proof? Where's the research? Mm. It's all anecdotal. Mm. Well, yeah, you're right. It is. It's all anecdotal. But you know what? It's, it's anecdotal on, on my property and it works. Yeah. You know, if you don't want to believe that, you know what? You don't have to. Well, and unfortunately, the, the science and the research has to be reductionist almost by definition. And, and this is a system that, that can't be reduced. And that's, no. the, that's, the, that's the barrier, I think, that we're going to have uh, to get around, probably not over, but to get around in order to, to really open this up to a, to a wider audience is that you can't necessarily, Gary Zimmer, we talked about this last time, I, I still remember him saying it, saying, at an acres conference, do we have to measure every dot? And, and and to your point, you can't. So why why should that be a goal? No, you know, and we talked about it last night in one of our Zoom school classes. That uh, you know, three hours worth last night. And one one of the one of the things was measuring. You know, monitoring versus measuring. As long as we monitor and we see that things are going okay, that's that's super. Mm -hmm. um, you have to monitor things in order to be able to adapt and make changes and replan and then do more monitoring. But a data collection set is not as valuable as a lot of people think it is. You know, you can collect all the data in the world. You've wasted an awful lot of time because we're 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 such a dynamic aspect that that data may have pertained to yesterday, but it doesn't yeah. pertain to today. Right. You know what? I, I think we really have to get our heads out of the sand and start to go back to the touchy feely, uh, you know, be part of it and, mm -hmm. and smell it and play with it. And as opposed to just, you know, having it sent to a lab and looked at, you know, right. it can come back with some data, but we really don't understand what that data means in the new system. Yeah. And we can't, you know what, the, the whole research aspect is research does not happen until something else happens. So I'll throw myself out there right now that, you know, I am trying things on Otter Creek golf course I am listening to others that have tried things. I'm, I'm adapting what I'm doing to my golf course and I'm trying things. Um, I'm, I'm learning. Uh, I'm having some failures. I'm having great successes, but when I have a failure, I've learned and I adapt and I move on. But research doesn't happen until things happen. And I, that's kind of, it's tough to say, but you know what, a university is not going to pull into my golf course and do any research until I may have had two or three years of saying, you know what, guys, I don't have any disease and all I'm putting out on my golf course is compost. Right. And then it's, oh my God, maybe we should start. We got to study this. <laughs> maybe we got to start studying this. Yeah. You know what? I think Great we're, point. we're falling behind the eight ball in that. Each golf course superintendent out there should be relying more on their feel and on their senses of what's going on on their property. What I do at Otter Creek is not going to work at Coeur d'Alene. Sure. sure. But the principles will work. Yep. Right? It, it's because it's, it's a natural system. Mm -hmm. The principles are all going to be the same. 
the way you manipulate it and the way you work it and how often or how little that's your site specific adaption and, and it's like and it's like when your kids are first learning to walk you've got to take the first step so what's the first step for somebody that's listening to this that's sitting in missouri and they're and their little podcast going this nut job booker i i, I don't know but I, I think i want to try something what what do you do first um you open your mind to new things what? i think that's that's the first thing you have to do yeah uh, you have to accept the fact that you know i've been a superintendent since the since early 1990s and I'm still learning. You know what? Uh, I don't have a closed mind. And that's the dilemma that we're dealing with. So first off, what you have to do is open your mind up and be transparent to yourself. Mm. Don't be biased. Look at things. Try things. Um, now, when it comes to the first thing that I would say for someone to do on their golf course, would be incorporate some carbon into your system. Mm -hmm. You know what? Uh, when you start to hear numbers come out that 50% of every nitrogen application that is put out on a golf course goes to waste. Hmm. Think about that with the prices today. Right? So if you're putting out two pounds of N, one pound of that is lost utilized. right off the bat. It's yes. either being, you know, washed through, it's being leached, or it's volatized, uh, gassed off, whatever you want to talk about. So the first, I, I think the first thing that you need to do, which is the first thing that I did, I started to incorporate some carbon entities. And it, my sense, it was humic acids, and it was sure. a sprayable sense, right? So I started to put humic acid in my system, which immediately, I can guarantee, and I'll, I'll go out on the line here as well, I can guarantee to everybody listening to this, that if you throw some carbon in with your nitrogen applications, you will cut your end rates by 30% without even thinking about anything else. Yep. We've, we've seen the same thing. And that's how we build our products is, is, is it's, that you're encapsulating almost. I don't know if that's yeah. the proper way to look at it, but. Well, you know what, when you, when you throw a humic acid in and, and fulvic acids, or you start to get into compost, you know, what you're really talking about is you're getting the ability to start to build up some humus. You know, so as Dan Dinelli has gone through with his biochar aspect, well, biochar, you know what, that is the, the ultimate uh, humic aspect you can think about, you know, as far as mineral uh, holding, water holding, uh, so on, so on. Microbe housing, all yeah. of that. Yeah. You know what? You, we have to start to get away from thinking that 1.5% organic matter is good. Right. You know, I've pushed it to myself. I'm up to 2.7 now. So when I still think about 2.7 OM on a traditional soil test, you still have to 58% of your OM. Help me with that number because I'm, it's still kind of going through. If, if you take a standard OM, say 2.7%, if I'm not mistaken, um, divide it by 1.72 to get your humus or your actual carbon oh, aspect out of that. Almost like your estimated nitrogen. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I, I, believe yeah, it's I, 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 right. I can't remember the calculation. Yeah. I believe it's 58% kind right. of thing, you know? So if you take that, so it, it's still a 2.7, take, you know, 50 plus percent of that. I'm still really only like 1%. Right. And that's not near enough. Yeah. So where does that put the guys that are sporting an 8.8% uh, hydroponic? Yeah. You know what? And it, it's no wonder, it's no wonder we, we stress in our systems don't work. It's sure. no wonder we're so sure. reliant on, on, um, you know, synthetic products and pesticides because yeah. you know what you, you, you know, we keep saying we're in an inert situation and, and I keep getting, wow, it's not inert. Well, no, uh, true. It's not inert, but it's 100% bacterial. You know what? And that just doesn't support a perennial grass. Right. What, so what's, what's in your, um, you've been at this in earnest for how many years? Four, four or five? Um, 
Obviously like, learning had, all the time. I, I've, I've been diving in this for over 10 years now. But okay, so, so my question, I, I, go ahead. I would say, I would say, as you say, in earnest, uh, like full bore five, six years. So I'll use the term because I can't think of a better one. What, what's in your chemicals at this point in time? What's in my chemical storage right now? Yeah. Um, do you, re, do you have, are there occasions or instances where you've still got to reach for chemistry, conventional yeah. chemistry or, okay. Yeah. Which is, which is acceptable, right? Because now, well, you know what, and this is the thing. So we'll go back into the, the regenerative aspect. So when I talk regenerative turf or regenerative egg, you know what, it, it's a, it's a system that means you're not extracting from it. You are contributing to it. Sure. So um, rather than killing all the life in the ground and just throwing synthetic products onto it and doing nothing but extracting out of the world, mm -hmm. you can start to increase your OM levels. And, and again, you know, basically increase your carbon or your humus level in the soil. Right. And get off the dependency of the synthetics. Get off the, the forever um, rolling down the hill, needing more products all the time. It's a system that you decrease those inputs. And from a farming standpoint, you are going to decrease those inputs. You're going to increase your yield and your profit, mm -hmm. um, let alone what you are giving to the planet. Right? right. So you're, you're, you're contributing back to the planet. We have to start to give something back to it. Otherwise yeah. it's not going to be there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I still occasionally have to, uh, my worst enemy right now is ants. So from a fungicide standpoint, um, I have not treated my teas or fairways with a fungicide in two full years now. Um, and that includes winter snow mold. Okay. And I have not sprayed teas for even longer than that. Um, it's been four years on teas without a drop of fungicide period. Hmm. Um, I don't get the disease anymore. Um, you know what? I, and I'm tempted next year. Actually, I left a couple of greens on, on our practice facility this year, one, especially in my one nursery. I didn't spray it this, uh, this, this fall. Uh, I did not put the snow mold application onto it. Um, right. I think if we are to get the biology in the right proportions, um, we don't need to worry about it. And, and if we do happen to have that one year that does give us a little bit of an issue from a snow mold standpoint. You know what? For the most part, where we are, um, it's going to be gone probably three weeks into the golf season. That's anyway. right. That's right. So much you of it is what? superficial to begin with. A lot of the guys in my area are doing the same thing right now. They're they're questioning. We're spending how much and in three weeks in the spring, it's gone anyway, regardless of whether we treat it or not. Why are we doing this? Yeah, but th but that's yeah. a th that's a mindset shift. That's a paradigm shift in itself that I got to get off this hamster wheel, right? Yeah. And once you yeah. do, there might be a little bit of short term pain, but in the long term, you, you gain on your budget, you gain on soil health, and you you know you gain you gain everywhere. Yeah, and you know what the 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 insecticide aspect is the only thing that I'm really having to deal with. As I said, I have a a pretty regular problem with ants on greens okay. um i don't really worry about it on fairways it's not that much of an issue and it occasionally becomes a little bit of an issue on tees when the ant hills start to become uh you know uh, mountains and mole hills instead of ant hills but yeah. you know what i still have to produce the surface on greens so um you know what, but I, I think there are still ways that we can play with those situations. You know what, the use of diatomaceous earth mm -hmm. and just the, the <clears throat> sharpness, if you think about those particles, um, right. with the silicon and you know what, the same thing with grubs. I really think that we can start to 
suppress the grub activity by twofold in one sense. You know what, if we start to get some of the, the, um, the good biological aspects there, they're going to start to, to look after the, the parasites to begin with. Sure. The other aspect is if we start to get a healthier system, and if we start to get a healthy soil that will give us the healthy plant, and I'm sure we've all seen it. You know what? Grub damage is only visible when the roots start to come up to the surface, mm -hmm. which draws the grubs up to the surface. Mm -hmm. Thus, you know what? When they start to get more of the, the rooting structure closer to the crown of the plants, when we start to see the, 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 the stress. And I don't see it really from a plant aspect. I see it from skunks and raccoons coming right. to forage for the food. Right. So even in that point, if we can develop a deeper rooting structure with a better biological advantage within that deeper rooting structure, those grubs are going to be eating down below. We're never going to have an issue with them. They're not going to be to the, yeah. the population that we have to worry about them. And if they are, by that time, hopefully our nematode aspect is sufficient enough. And I'll say that because mm. you know what? The, there's only 20% of the nematodes are, are parasitic nematodes. And why do we go out there and kill every nematode within the green surface to, to uh, look after, you know, 20% of them? Well, and unfortunately that's, it's, it's hard to select for that, but, but, at the same time, I mean, what you're doing is not unlike if if somebody's sick, you got strep throat, and you've got to take a, a, a an antibiotic. Nowadays, even even the most conventional of doctors tell you to do what right after? Take a probiotic. Yeah. Right. And so by yeah. by having your systems approach to it, even if you have to reach for traditional chemistries, you're right back on it, re rebuilding, regenerating, for lack of a better way of saying it that yeah. system again. So, you know, I think well, even you know that what? little shift is probably something that, that just about anybody can do to, to, to make one step towards it. Yeah. You know what? And, and one of the key phrases and one of the things, and, and I've understood it now for a few years, but I don't know whether many people have heard of like the quorum sensing aspect within soil. So mm. quorum sensing and quorum quenching, um, you know, quorum sensing, and I think if anybody's been on a board of directors, you all know what a quorum is, that you need a certain percentage of people to say yes in right. order for it to pass. Same thing happens within the biological process. So you can have all these organis organisms within the soil. Let's just put it to a, to a dollar spot standpoint. So you can have dollar spot fungi within your system. Mm -hmm. They're always there. Right. But if you have enough of the good guys in there, they will not allow that quorum to be reached by the dollar spot situation right. to say, OK, boys, you know what? Now we can act. So it's almost like, you know what? You, you can have a large assembly of, of, of the dollar spot fungus. But until they get to a volume large enough that they can begin to function as one, right? they don't become an issue. They never so, manifest themselves as a turf pest. Yeah, yeah. You know what? So quorum sensing is the ability to, to kind of stand off and not have that quorum get reached by the, the bad guys. Right. 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 So again, if you have enough of the good guys, the bad guys are not going to be there to do the harm. Exactly. Exactly. Great point. So we, of course, <laughs> are almost <laughs> up against the time. Shocking, right? We, we, no rabbit trails were, were found here at all. So, so real, real briefly, Randy, one of the things that I wanted to get to that we're not going to be able to spend enough time on, if somebody was interested in looking at testing their soils for other for things other than NPK, because we've got lots of sources for that. Um, give us two resources quick that, that people can research on their own as far as, you know, you mentioned Earth Fort Labs. 
Yeah. Um, that's one that, that we've worked with on some of our products on, on some testing of, of, you know, client soils, but, um, are there others that they should look into as far as things to kind of quantify whether they're making the right steps? Um, well, you can, you can just question some of your labs as to whether or not they do some of these tests in, in a, uh, more of a biological assay format. You can, um, ward labs, which, you know, we're not familiar with up here in Canada, but ward labs does a, um, a PLFA W A R D W A R D S. Okay. Um, they get into some, uh, phospholata or I'm trying to think of that, <laughs> the fatty acids. Okay. I think it's a PLFA test. Yeah. Um, it's not it, woods. It's not woods, is it? Or no, it's words. words. Okay. Yeah. Um, but just start to, to think more along the line of what kind of biology do I have in the ground? And yeah. you know what? Ward, uh, Ward Labs does those tests, but Earthfort, um, of course, being in the States, you know, I had a hell of a time because I had to send some samples to Earthfort from Canada. Really I had to hard, have them, isn't it? Oh, I had to have them send me a special permit. My, my package actually had to go to LA to the U.S., um da, DA first yeah. and, and to be exposed and looked at and then they would transmit it up to, to earth for it which you could you, know, you could probably it, ship a bag of dope a lot easier than a bag of soil couldn't you oh well, hell yeah <laughs> right but i tell you what those the numbers that i got back um the mind-blowing key being so what i mean obviously they write a nice report but what are what what is the key to 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 Randy Booker to know that, okay, I'm making progress here. The fungal to bacterial ratio. Bingo. Okay. That is the key. Fungal um, being greater than. Fungal being equal to or greater than. Correct. Correct. Um, and and I, when I got my test back, uh, I was very, very surprised. Um, and I had actually used a little tool called microbiometer. Right. And I have to contact both Earthfort and Microbiometer because apparently they are working together now. So yeah. the Microbiometer is is becoming a recognized tool for a little on-site quick test. Right. But I don't think their numbers match up because um, I I did some some microbiological tests beforehand and I had a, like a 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7 to one. So 0.6 back or fungal to a one oh. uh, bacterial, which is good, which that surprised me as well, because I also started out in the spring and the results were only 0. 0.4 to one. Mm. So there's a, a switch, which again, you know what, that system goes up and down through the That's season. Right. Sure. Environmental situations, moisture is the whole deal. But when I got the earth fort test back, um, and I sent them seven samples. So I did three greens, actually four greens, a tea, two fairways, and I sent them a, the, a compost sample, the compost mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I use. Right. I sent to them as well to be broken down to the biological component. And um, I'm averaging about 1.2 to one right now. Oh, good. Yeah, which can really explain why I don't get a lot of disease. Yeah. And it can certainly explain why I'm not having to add a lot of other inputs because mm -hmm. I have the fungal capacity there to do an awful lot of the mining of the nutrients for me. Right, right. And then I also had the same samples sent to micro roots, which is just up the road from earth fort labs in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And they came back with a, a mycorrhizal colonization number. So what they did is they took my samples and they stained them and they put them under the electron microscope and away they look at them to see the percent of roots or the amount of, let, let's say the, the measurement, the number of roots I had and the number of those roots that were colonized by mycorrhiza. And, and what was the name of that lab again? Myco Roots. Oh, so so uh, Dr. Amaranthus's lab that does mycorrhiza? That, that does, basically I, he just I, does mycorrhizal counts. Yeah, okay. I, Spore counts and colonizations. Okay. It's M-Y-C-O. Yep. 
right? R O O T S. Yep. If you just go on, go on the, um, go on, search on the internet. You know, okay. pull up Earth Four Labs, and you can Perfect. go through your process and look at it. The same thing with the micro roots. But I came back, I got those re results, and I have not inoculated um, an awful lot with mycorrhiza. It's mm -hmm. just, it's a very difficult thing for us to get into the ground unless we're brand new build. It, it's and tough to get it, into the it, country because we're trying like heck to get one of our products in the country and I cannot, we, we can't break through it right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, Which is really unfortunate considering what value it could bring to a piece of property that in a country where you're trying to restrict as many chemicals as possible we you know we've got these tools but we can't get them to you it's really it's really oh. a, it's really a, a conundrum i don't understand it gee where do you think the red tape's coming from yeah, exactly <laughs> somewhere in ottawa um, yeah the uh but funny i my testing came back and my mycorrhizal colonization on on greens was 49% Okay. On, on teas was 45%. And on the one fairway I had them test was 43%. And in their scale of rating, they go um, above 30% is excellent colonization. Awesome. And I'm going, whoa. Um, so I kind of posed this question to Nicole. I said, why, why have I got such a mycorrhizal colonization when I've never put anything there? And, and you know what, uh, we're in kind of that, that sterile type situation. Um, she said, what have you added? Mm. I said, well, I've used trichoderma. Mm -hmm. I use trichoderma an awful lot for its uh, fat eating aspect, as well as the symbiotic relationship with the plant period. And uh, vermicast extracts, um, you know, pseudomonas species. And right. she said, there you go. So you've got three components right there that have a very strong synergistic effect within the soil. If you can get the pseudomonas bacterial standpoint there, you can get the, um, the trichoderma, the beneficial fungi going in there, then you will have mycorrhiza colonization right. just come in naturally. Because well, and of just like you said about disease and also nutrient, I mean, it's there. We just need to get out of the way and let it do its thing. And, you know, a lot of conventional chemistries really beat the heck out of that system. And oh, they and, wipe it. And if you're, if you're backing off of a lot of that, you know, that in it, that in itself will, will definitely foster that, um, and, and, and give you the benefit. So well, the, the key, the key is just, just the one point, the key is that we've, we've always been a, what do we need to kill today? What am I going to have to kill? Right. What you do know, I have when, to take dominion over today, right? Yeah, you know what? When we get away from thinking about the fungicide standpoint, so there's there's a step for everybody to take. Back off preventative sprays. Right. Don't put them out there until you absolutely need them. All right, you're going to see a little wee bit of disease before it hits you. You know what? It's not like you're going home to come in in the morning and have 95% um, you know, infection on the golf course, you know right. what, you may have one or two of those hot spots you see, don't just spray because your sales guys come in and, and sold you a program for the whole year on the early order program, mm. you know, which I just laugh at, but back off on some of those inputs and allow some of those beneficials to start coming yeah. back. Yeah. Um, if you do have to spray a fungicide, you know what, get yourself to a point where you can start to go out with some compost extracts and then whether sure. you purchase them, um, you know, worm power, I don't mean, you know, but that's just one that you can, you've got some as well, but, but get products that are out there that can start to re-inoculate the biology after you wiped out a little bit of it. Well, and the irony, start... the irony of it is the less you use, the more effective it is when you do have to reach for it because you're not overusing. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and one thing I'll just, you know, I, I, one thing I'm really intrigued about from, from uh, earthwork standpoint, which I am really going to push. And I'm hoping that your Canadian aspect can be up here with the C3. 
I'm hoping so too. We're working to on it. To play with some, you know, just the worm suppression aspect. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're working on it. Yeah. Um, you know what? The key is just, just start to play with the system a little bit more. Right. Um, you know, let it do its thing and 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 go with the open mind. And okay. you know what? I think you'd be surprised at how it works. Okay. So to wrap up, you 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 referenced a video that I have seen. You started to describe it and the light bulb came on right away. I knew what you were talking about. So in 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 talking to a group group of people that may want to do things a little bit different, you, you referenced that video about get up and dance. So describe that and we're going to wrap up with that. Because I think it's a great analogy. Of just, you know, that, that, right? It is. It is. Okay. So everybody envision yourself being at a concert in the park. Um, you know, and it's a concert ball that was built with a little bit of slope. So you've got the band down below and everybody's sitting on the banks coming up. And everybody's kind of in a blah, blah mood sitting there and just going, eh, okay, this is all right. You know what? Everybody looks over and they see this one idiot. <laughs> and that's the perception, right? That's we you, talked right? about this earlier, right? <laughs> you see this one regenerative idiot that, <laughs> that is, look at that guy. He's up and he's dancing and he looks like a fool, you know, and everybody starts to laugh at him and everybody's going, oh, what an idiot. And, you know, they're elbowing each other and pointing over to the guy. And then before you know it, oh, shit, there's another guy over there. <laughs> And it's like, no, oh, we got two idiots. Oh, no, oh, we've got five. Yeah. You know what? Before you know it, you're the lone one sitting on the ground. Yeah. So you get up and start dancing too. So yeah, yeah, that's kind of where I feel that I am. And I, I, I know there are others out there. Um, I know there are a few golf clubs in New Zealand that are well into this as well that I've been told to contact. And I know there are some other facilities in, in the States that are doing yeah. very good things. The same deal. There are guys. Um, get start up and to dance. Speak up. Yeah. Get, get up, up and, and dance. dance. You know yeah. what? Start to speak up. Uh, it, it's, it needs to, needs to be heard. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a perf perfect way to end it. I think that's exactly what, you know, and, and, and don't think in, in either wanting to do things differently or if you are already on that path i mean i've got a former assistant that is looking forward to listening to this he got so much out of the first one and he is he's trying to figure out how to plant um uh forbes on his fairways and i said and we can't we can't do that but you know he's into it but he's one guy and he's just he's the fool dancing all by himself right now so um hey, Joe, it's the it's it's limitless you you know yeah. what yeah. if you have a a, a a thought you can figure it out yeah exactly you know well, and, and that's um again anybody contact me you know part of my taking this course with nicole was not only um because of my interest aspect but she actually inquired and asked me if if i would be interested to do this because um she has some pretty good pull uh around the world from speaking engagements mm. and and knowing a lot of situations and um there are some opportunities put forth in front of me right now to be able to get out and start to speak and start to teach some of these ways great um so you know what uh maybe acres usa will be on uh my my list uh I, i'm kind of hoping that you know maybe gcs AA will will take a step down from mm. their uh, platform and start to think a little bit more along these lines as well, because, you know, we said before, they don't really like to think about a different way. Right. Um, but I'm here and anybody wants me, uh, just get a hold of me because the word's going. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Randy Booker, regenerative dancer. Thank you for us again. And obviously we're gonna we're gonna have to get together one more time because I'm about to have my list, but really <laughs> um keep up the good work, keep keep spreading the word. You're 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 on the right path. Um, you're not the only dancer. There's guys out there and a lot of guys that maybe don't have wanna wanna start dancing. So thanks. You're inspiring. Um keep up, 
keep up all the good work. Uh, Kevin, it's my pleasure. And, and uh, thank you. And thank uh, Earthworks for the, uh, the support going down these roads. Yep. And all I think about is what Joel and Jerry put up with when they started the process. Right. Think about um, that. Yeah. It's so, yeah. you know, Joel, Joel, I'm with you. <laughs> they were, they were swimming upstream for a long time and now you there's a it. lot of people copying them. So it's, it's a yep. great feeling. So thanks awesome. so much. Uh, thank you for everybody uh, listening. And if you aren't subscribing, make sure to do so. So you get our, our regular updates. Um, have a great week. Mm -hmm.